in uh, Hyderabad All India Ophthalmic Society Conference, where Dr. Ursaker was there, and Dr. Patnaik was the main person to be uh, along with Dr. Badinath to start, but somehow he questioned us so much, and Dr. Badinath got uh, fed up and he said, I don't want politics, and he, we actually dismantled. We were starting as a group, but we dismantled. And 91, 90, I came to, uh, 88, I came to Bombay Hospital, 90, I started at Jodh, and 91, we had several meetings with Dr. Kanti Modi, Dr. B.T. Muscati, Dr. Ursekar, Dr. Rumi Jahangir, Rajul Parekh, and I think six of us are the um, you know, founding members of the Society. Still, I remember the first conference was held in Calcutta, AOS in 92, and hardly 25 people attended, and we didn't have sponsor. Appa Sami was the first sponsor. With these few words, I wanted to say he is a father figure in vitreoretinal surgery in India. And uh, even though Dr. Badnath did uh, a very vast institute, but Dr. Ruskaker in his own capacity did that. And the credit to him is, even I think even in 1988, he was quite old, but he was going to Duke's vitreoretinal uh, course every year in Durham. That's the founding Dr. Robert McCamer who in, uh, did the course and uh, organized the course and he was attending and he used that time I didn't travel much but he used to come and give me the notes. Thanks to you sir, wherever you are, may your soul rest in peace. So coming back to the the uh, thanks to Zeiss for the, I call it a 3D fantasy surgery and the joy of doing 3D surgery uh, is uh, really great and I'm enjoying it because uh, I actually have designed a Maharaja chair. That means you'd like to sit like this and operate. I never thought you will operate like that because I always used to tell you to stay, sit erect like that and operate. But here, uh, Dr. Eckhart used to call it head up surgery. And I, I just watched him a few, maybe last year, not few months, last year, 2019. And uh, I was with Dr. Klaas Eckhart and he was always telling this is going to be the future. And two years back, he started live surgery using 3D, but uh, somehow uh, I think didn't pick up, but now I think uh, it's going to pick up. And it's, it's uh, my hey, I'm uh, Professor Dr. Eshnatrajan. I'm the world leader on 3D RTO. I don't have any financial interest. I'm using this Zeiss uh, 850 RTO, and uh, this is the 3D system. And we have the monitor here for uh, uh, the assistant to see, as well as the surgeon. And uh, you can have uh, Sister uh, Smita here. She's a wonderful assistant. We use the world's best technology, the Alcon. Again, I don't have any financial interest. The Alcon uh, uh, system uh, for the uh, the constellation for a vitrectomy, endolaser, and the 3D system. And I'm routinely doing this 3D surgery. And I wear the 3D glass, which helps also to prevent uh, corona. I have a PPE, I have a gown, glove, double glove, and I wear a N95 mask. All of us are wearing N95, thanks to the anesthetist, thanks to Jaydev, my Vilas, and uh, thank you all. So, welcome to my show today on RTO 3D. And since You'll see the world class surgery by a world class surgeon. Thank you. So, this is our uh, team, and I'm happy that uh, anesthetic every time I was they have to see through a small, uh, like a peeping hole surgery, and we can see the so everybody can see what you're doing. So, I remember a class tech art used to say that uh, earlier, if you make a mistake, only the assistant can see, and that also sometimes he cannot see because the visualization is a problem, but now. The whole world can see or if you're transmitting the whole world can see so i think that's where the uh, you have to be uh, uh, like uh, well versed. and as you see here you can uh, sit little with a backrest and hand rest and i you visualize this is actually a spherophakia in the lens in the antechamber and i'm uh, starting the surgery and i'm making the infusion line with the 25 gauge and then i use the uh, and i think as a vitreoretinal surgeon you like to be ambidextrous and thanks to again, uh, I keep remembering my mentor daily, Dr. Badinath, for training us. And we, we use the wet lab and this patient, you can see, uh, and the staphyloma. And that's because of the intraocular pressure went up, I think, in between. And then uh, you, you, you can see here that uh, this particularly, the Zeiss, as I said, I don't have any financial interest, but you have the oculus. If in case you are not comfortable in the beginning, you can use the ocular, but I have turned off the uh, oculus and then I'm using, watching the, a screen and that's uh, what uh, is uh, uh, you see here and the 
and the 3D vitreoretinal surgery uh, is a revolutionary technology to change the way a surgeon performs vitreoretinal surgery. Benefits both the surgeon and the patient and can be a widely accepted platform in the uh, future. And uh, so it's a high 3D high definition camera mounted on the microscope, a computer with processors, the input and output signals, a high definition display unit and 3D glasses to view the display. Maybe this is the future of uh, robotic surgery. And the benefits with the digital 3D VR surgery, improved ergonomics, posture at the microscope for several hours leads to musculoskeletal fatigue and pain. And I don't agree with that totally because even here, you have to have the posture and make sure you do exercise. You do dance, according to me, vitreoretinal surgeons should do dance to uh, make sure that the abdomen muscles, the protagonist and the attendant, the back muscles have to be strong so that you don't get musculoskeletal fatigue. Many surgeons have got back problem, including Dr. Rajanath, my other colleague, Dr. Gupal, and I think they were all having back problems. So I think the, the only way to prevent is exercise and you have to be strong. And with the surgical field, displayed on a unit placed at a convenient position. The surgeon can maintain an ergonomically neutral position. This reduces musculoskeletal fatigue for the surgeon. And I think uh, this is what the company claims. As I said, in addition, we should do physical exercise. And I remember Steve Charles always mentioning, yes, he runs between cases in the OT, and that's what is uh, important to make sure you are. Uh, and the benefits is like uh, what you are seeing, the whole OT can, the OT staff can see with the 3D, and everything is seen on a big screen. And because it's with the computer, you can manipulate the images, you can edit well for the teaching later. So it's an excellent tool where I always say that when you're seeing through a microscope, it's like seeing through a small keyhole and seeing the whole world. Here you're seeing through a wide screen, like a 70 m movie and operating. And I think, uh, and you, you can uh, sit uh, comfortably, you can see in this uh, so photograph below, you sit comfortably and operate. And uh, it's a digitally enhanced visualization, Dynamic contrast can improve brightness, even with low illumination. Apply dynamic digital filters to enhance visualization. Image quality often better than the traditional microscope. Digitally magnified inverted images possible and digitally enhanced uh, the significantly low end illumination used translate to lower phototoxicity for the foot retina. Filters applied can enhance visualization of stained tissue, which in turn requires dilute dyes and digitally applied red-free filter and uh, good adaptability. Switching to 3D, uh, digital 3D VR surgery can be a challenge with a learning curve, even for an experienced surgeon. But I always said, because I think mentally, and I'm passionate about retinal surgery, and I breathe in and breathe out ophthalmology, and that is most of the time with retinal surgery. And because of that, most of the time, I am actually, I really learned a life coach, I underwent a life coach lesson for generally a leadership program, where she taught me, you should have a mental movie and a mental uh, rehearsal of the movie. And that, that means I learned, uh, Typewriting, and I don't know how many of you learn typewriting. You have you are not supposed to see the keyboard and type, and you are supposed to see the page or a book which you are going to type, and then do it. So you first uh, lesson will be A S D F G F semicolon L K J J, and then you can also type A to Z and Z to A, and that's why I can tell Z to A without any. Uh, 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 flaw. The reason is, I think you have to mentally practice. And because I learned typewriting at a much younger age, and I didn't, I wanted to be more uh, uh, compete with the guys who are uh, typists. So I, I was mentally preparing after the typing. Same thing I applied. And there is a thing called mirror neurons. In that's where the skill transfer. We have the difficulty of an experienced surgeon giving it to the younger surgeon. So I think you have to have a mental movie. And that's how the learning curve can be made to almost zero. And then uh, RTU has uh, the digital optics, the ad vision, the cloud connectivity, the hybrid mode, auto adjust. And I'm going to show you some examples of surgery. And you see here a uh, 25 gauge three. So here you're making a three port pass panometrectomy. And as, as you see here, you see this entire thing on a 70 mm screen. And then uh, you operate. It's like watching a, a real, a, a something like Star Wars. And that's what was my fantasy when I was a, a kid. And I remember seeing the uh, movie in the uh, IMAX uh, experience. And something like that I enjoyed. And I always wanted to, I, I, I imagine an eye model 
where you can walk over the optic disc and see the lens above and then the pupil like that and that's my imagination and there was a movie once upon a taken taken from within the eye so you see the really the processes the iris and then similar thing can be done and one day probably possible using a camera within the eye and you, you here you see a uh, total electric transfer now that will come from liquid being injected and uh, you, you, you can make sure that they, you see from the disc to the periphery and all this is uh, possible because of the uh, i think the, the whatever you see your assistant the nurse and the boys can see and i think uh, if you read this talad's uh, uh, first uh, chapter in point number 2 he says you can see there is a giant retinal tear and the peripheral carbon liquid is filled up to the extreme periphery and then you are doing the endolaser photocoagulation around the giant retinal tear and you see the retina totally attached and there is a curved uh, laser probe which we do the endolaser around the uh, break and uh, and i think uh, you are also improve the endo illuminator which can illuminate all the 360 degree which is still a uh, problem and i think uh, here uh, you uh, for after that you do a pfcl silicon oil exchange and you can see that uh, the pfcl oil uh, you, you don't see the meniscus but uh, using the 3d system and i, I think the things are so smooth and uh, I, I you see a small rim of light which is uh, actually the pfcl oil uh, Uh, where you are uh, actually doing it and you are using the pfc and you can see some pfcl bubbles which will be finally removing it using the retinal brush and finally at conclusion you remove all the three ports after completing the oil and i wanted to say this and if you have the entry port well and you don't have to suture them and i we have my professor peter crawl from uh, frank uh, from marburg uh, philips university in germany used to come and tell me how can you not uh, suture a uh, 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 323 gauge in your history i said no if you make a good wound and i think you don't have to do suturing and here uh, my the anterior segment surgeon is dr kavita rao with me who is doing the cataract with the um, uh, intraocular uh, lens implantation and i am glad every surgeon in our hospital are using the 3d but i have switched over from uh, totally the uh, from the regular microscope to the 3d surgery uh, all the time and i i do, uh, and the only thing is since i have three operation theater but only one 3d system i like to operate every case in this ot and the reason is i think it's phenomenal to use that and, and then later even for teaching and uh, here because we are going to do a report uh, with rectum following that uh, uh, kavitha rao places one suture uh, and completes the cataract with the intraocular lens uh, implant and then after that i proceed because i don't like the cataract surgeon coming back again because i don't do cataract neither uh, i don't do any pk or anything but i make the cataract surgeon do everything and i usually tell them do your part and get out and then i get in and that's what i'm doing here now i play uh, after the cataract with the intraocular lens uh, using the 3d and uh, making the three port uh, parpena vitrectomy and and proceeding with the vitrectomy and you can see this is a i where you are doing a three port parpena vitrectomy you see a, a epiretinal membrane so going from the macula to the periphery and make sure that uh, there is actually a Uh, uh, I think it's a post buckle. So you saw some cryo in the uh, periphery, and now I'm following uh, vitrectomy. I'm using a steroid to stain the vitreous, and then I use the uh, uh, brush to clear, and also the vitreous cutter with suction to clear all the uh, 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 the steroid. And then finally, under air, I use uh, brilliant blue to stain the uh, internal limiting membrane. and you can see the visualization which is the advantage of using this and i always use a wide angle i am happy to say i am the pioneer in wide angle after spitzner introduced wide angle in 1987 published in one graphe and after that somehow i don't know why even in germany it was not popular and i think sometimes i say jesus is not well known in jerusalem and i think it takes time same thing happened and they is a associate of uh, frank kosh who is a professor now in uh, um, kuwait university frankfurt i'm glad he has made me a visiting professor there uh, who is using the biome and i am think uh, 
I was the first used biome for a long time in India and in the world. And I remember teaching in 93 to the, when I used to visit Lenox Hill Hospital in New York to teach them to use the biome, but they were not willing. So this is a parental membrane which is removed and uh, using the 3D. And then thanks, uh, uh, this is my three, third generation and grandfather and father. And I think, I don't know whether you have a gene to do microvitreous surgery. And I always like to quote uh, my mentor, uh, Swami Vivekananda, arise, awake, and stop not till the goal is reached. And the goal will be to do the, as Charles Keepen says, do the least to, to the retina so that you can atraumatically reattach the retina and enjoy 3D surgery. Thank you very much. Thanks to... Uh, all India Autonomic Society and Zaif for the opportunity. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Natarajan, uh, for really very lucidly putting forth the, the, the new technology and, and the potential and, and uh, how it can really help and, and the future that's coming. So great, that was a really nice talk. And I think now we have uh, Aditya Nilkar will be presenting. Navrata, would you like to? Uh... I think uh, it was an excellent talk, uh, Dr. Hatrajan, and uh, covered very well. And your initial part was also uh, very enlightening for all the generations who don't don't know or who are who are unaware rather about. Dr. Urseker, and like always, very inspiring talk, uh, Dr. Nitrajan. Uh, thank you, Namrata. I'm glad I made a cornea surgeon listen to it uh, talk after a long time. Otherwise, we talk something else. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. I think Aditya now has yeah. quite a few ready for us. So good evening. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I hope uh, you are able to see my videos. And uh, Namrata, Aditya, Dr. Cyrus Shroff, and Dr. Uh, uh, the Darius Shroff are uh, Red Buckler Award winners. And the Red Buckler is actually made in the same as Oscar. And I think not only that, American Society for Retina Specialists, most of the time, Indian veterinary surgeons uh, win the award. So congratulations to Darius, Thank Cyrus, you. and uh, yeah. Aditya. Thank you, sir. At the same time, I'm sure everybody knows that you are from, uh, you are the one of the members of ASRS and uh, you are amongst the Hall of Fame of ASRS. Last to last year, I think you received that award. Yeah, thanks to ASRS because they have kept me along with Star Guards, Juan Rafe, and uh, also, uh, what's his name? Uh, they, uh, our ophthalmoscope, that's the first one, uh, Helmholtz. So I'm happy I'm part of Helmholtz, Dr. Badinath, Steve Charles, and everybody. Thank you. Uh, meanwhile, Kripal, can you give the moderator's link to Dr. Cyrus Shroff sir, and Dr. Rajesh Sena, the moderator's link, please, for the questions? Yes, Aditya. So, uh, are you able to see the screen? So yeah, no, it. we are able to see your screen, but your presentation is not open. We can see all the videos. So to make it full um, screen, yes. uh, you have to open the presentation and make it full screen. We okay. can see your uh, desktop. Thumbnails we can see in your... Uh, Folder 5 December. Yeah. Just give me a minute. Yeah. You'll have to stop share, yeah. open it, and then open it from the video first. Open right. PowerPoint That's presentation. Right. In the 10 shares. In the so me and Namrata can sleep and do Zoom. <laughs> How is it now? Yeah. Uh, no, it is now. Not. You have to make a full screen. Open one of the presentation. Let us see. Just play one video. Whichever video you want to do first. Yeah, just a minute. Sorry for this. No, no, no problem. Are they embedded in a PowerPoint also or are they yeah, all separate? They're separately arranged. But you can go to the share screen, but share the share the entire the, this one, the desktop, not just the your the, your video. You played it when uh, some in the trial. Yeah, in the meantime, uh, Namrata and Rajesh have used the 3D, no? 
yes we have uh, used 3d but for anterior segment not for posterior segment and i think for anterior segment also it's oh, a, yeah. it's a great tool to have maybe yeah. i just wanted to show yeah. i do still using it isn't dr atul using it for uh, vr also yeah yeah he is using for vr i hope uh, now at least the screen is visible to you yes yes, yes. it is all right so i'll show you my first case and this is a chandelier assisted scleral buckle surgery nowadays the scleral buckling surgery itself has become uh, quite rare this is a patient with an inferior detachment with a hill view vitreous view because of the vitreous haze and also a little bit of cataract this patient had so i wanted to uh, do a scleral buckle because the break was inferior and this is a 45 year old male so don't wish to damage his lens at this age so i'm isolating the muscles first of all and then we'll put in a chandelier to see the inside part of the vitreous cavity with an indirect ophthalmoscope the illumination is very poor so you won't be able to see as good as what you can see with this uh, chandelier illumination system so i use the resight i i visualize the break you can see the vitreous haze that was making the visibility uh, poor so once i mark the break we are going to cryo and then will place a small segmental buckle over the over that area i use a sponge because as you know i have been trained with dr nakpal sir and this is his favorite uh, explant to use for uh, retinal detachment surgery one can also do a radial buckle in this situation but i prefer to do a segmental buckle because there was a doubtful break also in uh, superior temporal quadrant so this is the 50 uh, suture that you want and the buckle is in place and you can see a good indentation effect in spite of the fact that the vitreous is hazy the visibility is good because of uh, the chandelier system so there was a doubtful break also in the superior temporal quadrant which was also covered by the sponge and the surgery is over i'll go to the next uh, video now this is the post operative outcome you can see the break is well covered by the buckle and the retina is attached i'll move to the next video this is about a diagnostic dilemma in a patient which is being operated for vitreous hemorrhage after the hemorrhage is cleared i am not sure whether this is a hole or a pseudo hole and the oct makes it very easy for me to understand that this is just a pseudo hole and i can proceed with my vitrectomy and remove that uh, vitreous traction and later on post operatively you can see it's a well flattened retina then there is another interesting uh, piece that recently i have uh, come across this is a 3 year old child who presented to us with a yellow reflex while the parents tried to take a picture on their mobile phone and this was a coats disease confirmed on ct scan and also on uh, examination under anesthesia so we decided to drain this uh, externally but first i cleared up a little bit of vitreous i injected some pfcl so as to increase the intraocular pressure so that the drainage becomes more effective i use a trocar and allow the drainage to happen you can see the cholesterol crystals being drained and the retina is getting flattened and intraoperative oct shows that there is a posterior nodule unfortunately that means the uh, macular area is not very healthy and the visual prognosis may not be that great but definitely it will help us to prevent the thysis or neovascular complications of in this child and maybe some useful vision may still be retained Uh, cryopexy is being done after drainage to the site of a uh, angioma and then the pfcl is aspirated
Next is surgery is about uh, a macular hole. After a fluid air exchange and ILM peeling, this patient also had epiretinal membrane. So the epiretinal membrane is removed, and I am peeling the internal limiting membrane. I am try, trying to make a inverted flap because of the size of the hole is bigger in this case. So I position it over the macular hole. And then after the fluid air exchange, I want to confirm that this uh, flap is in place or not. And I realize that the flap is slightly displaced. As you can see, the quality of uh, OCT even on uh, after air exchange is that good. And you can see that the ILM flap has got displaced. And therefore, uh, I need to make a little bit of a maneuver to reposition it. So I reposition it using the diamond dusted membrane scraper. As such, with a naked eye or through the microscope to identify this displacement would have been difficult. But now you can confirm with the OCT that this flap is back in place and this patient would end up having a good outcome at the end of the surgery. You listening to this? You know? The next surgery is about a post-traumatic patient who developed corneal tear uh, cataract and intraocular foreign body. This is the corneal tear being repaired. We are just actually literally playing around with the OCT to confirm that uh, the wound leak is sealed completely. And then proceed and have a look at this uh, OCT and you can have see that there's an abnormal bulge of the posterior capsule, which means this patient definitely probably has a posterior capsular tear and which we experienced firsthand as soon as we introduced the FACO probe. So then we proceeded with the vitrectomy cutter, removed the vitreous image and the remnants of the lens fragments. This patient had a, an intraocular foreign body. So you can see kind of frosted branch angiitis pattern, occlusive vasculitis caused by inflammation. So I'm trying to induce a PVD, but it's not getting easily separated. And I don't want to induce any breaks here. So I decide to now place a PFCL and remove the foreign body impacted onto the posterior pole first. Although the PFCL floats over the foreign body, I'm not really concerned because ultimately I'm going to use a magnet and the PFCL is only to protect the posterior pole if this foreign body happens to fall back onto the posterior pole again. So with the magnet, this foreign body is removed, the sclerotomy is sutured, and then PFCL is aspirated. And then along with that, I also induce a posterior vitreous detachment. And then the endo laser is done around the site of uh, impaction after clearing the epiretinal or uh, the preretinal hemorrhage. And I could place the three piece intraocular lens because the anterior capsule was intact, and a three piece IOL could be placed in front of the, in, in the sulcus, in front of the anterior capsule. Now, this is another case uh, which was referred to us for the dislocation of a three-piece intraocular lens. So after completing the vitrectomy, we plan to do a Yamanese IOL without externalizing this intraocular lens. So first of all, uh, a vitrectomy is being performed. Then I make two side ports because I may have to use a forceps to hold the lens. I use Agarwal's markers for this sclerotomy marking 
and I'm going in with a 27 gauge toker directed 180 degrees apart and also inject a PFCL on the posterior pole just to make sure if the IOL dislocates, it doesn't damage the posterior pole. Then internally to fix this intraocular lens, I am not going to use a needle because this needle might unnecessarily hit some part of the retina. So I'm using forceps through the trocar and using a handshake technique, ensure that the forceps grasp the tip of the haptic. And then I remove the trocars so that externalizing the haptic will become easy. So once the trocar is out, I externalize the haptic transconjunctivally. And then I can plunge this haptic using a diathermy ballpoint, ballpoint cotton. And then similarly, the second haptic is also externalized using the forceps. And the assistant is holding on to the externalized haptic so as to ensure that it doesn't get dislodged. Once again, we have to ensure that the tip of the haptic is grasped in the forceps so that the haptic doesn't suffer any damage while it is being externalized. So I'm still not very happy with the tip of the haptic it's inside the forceps. So once I'm sure that there is no And then again, remove the trocars and then externalize the haptic. And then we can plunge this. And that's the uh, spherical fixation. The uh, centration of the IOL is very nice compared to the other types of spherical fixated IOLs. That's what I feel. And of course, at the end, you, one has to remove the PFCL. And I'm just checking the macula if there's any uh, cystoid macular edema or a peritoneal membrane. That's the end of the case. Now, this is a, a patient which has an optic disc pit, as you can see, and a little bit of uh, macular thinning. But I want to confirm there is a macular hole or not, although it can be also confirmed preoperatively. But also intraoperatively, you get a feedback that uh, there's thinning but no hole. And the previous surgery has been done using an inverted ILM flap. That flap also you can see on the fovea. So in this case, I'm going to use a amniotic membrane graft to fix the pit. And to ensure that this graft is easily visible, I have stained it using the brilliant blue dye. So once this uh, graft is uh, placed over the optic pit, I can use the intraoperative OCT to ensure a snug fit of the graft. So here, at least on visible clues, one feels that it might be good enough. But the OCT has to confirm that it is in place. But here I saw that uh, it is slightly still floating in front of the optic pit and it may be fitted a little bit better so as to avoid its displacement. So what we did here is uh, once again, the intraoperative OCD came to our rescue and we could snug fit this graft better. Uh, this is a patient with a tractional retinal detachment. And you can see an extensive fibrous proliferation over the disc and macula. Thankfully, it looks more ovascular because the patient also has received avastin in the past. So our trick is uh, uh, to create a small opening in the posterior hyaloid near the equator and separate all the anterior posterior attachments first and then we attack the membrane. So using a cutter, I'm going over this macular area because I know that a dissection plane has been now identified.
and i always uh, like dr natarajan sir has shown us i always keep the cutter over the membrane so as to uh, avoid the risk of uh, iatrogenic break and i also use a reflux mode as you can see on the left hand side the proportional reflux to ensure that there is some kind of a hydro dissection that happens under the membranes so that i get another dissection plane and i can easily keep dissecting these membranes right up to the disc without creating any iatrogenic break and then the rest of the fibrous tissue proliferation which is extending onto the nasal retina is then peeled off using the cutter again thankfully in this case we did not encounter any iatrogenic breaks or any uncontrolled bleeding maybe thanks to the pre operative anti vegf treatment and again proportional reflux wherever we encounter the pegs which are holding on to the membrane we use the proportional reflux to separate the membranes from the retinal surface and then we can keep on trimming these membranes with the cutter alone so in spite of these extensive fibrous proliferations uh, we did not have to use any forceps or scissors at the same time the entire surgery could be still carried out using three dimensional uh, digital microscope initially we had issues with the learning curve with this microscope to visualize the membranes or to identify the dissection planes and whenever there used to be any bleeding on the posterior pole to identify retinal tissue underneath the bleeding used to be difficult but with time and i think with our patients ultimately we are getting used to this uh, technology more and more and uh, have started liking it as the time passes by otherwise initially whenever there used to be any complex case we used to be hesitant in using a three dimensional microscope but now we are more and more happy about using this equipment so since there are no additional uh, no iatrogenic breaks and patient ultimately did well and this is the post operative uh, picture so with that uh, i come to the end of my presentation i hope you enjoyed these uh, surgical videos thank you great presentation uh, aditya is really nice videos and wonderfully performed surgery thank you aditya Let's. Uh, I think you brought out all the nuances about the diabetic traction detachment, how to manage it, and in fact, uni manually nowadays with the proportional reflux and the twenty-five gauge cutter and the twenty-seven, how you can get into the plane of surgery and even do it. Uh, uh, not having to resort to by manual in many situations where earlier one may have needed to do that and i think both the interest the optic pit and the ilm and the uh, macular hole were also very interesting and uh, the only observation i had was that for the uh, it's very nice that as you saw the position of the ilm over the macular hole and sort of pressing it there but i think practically speaking you never know why, where it keeps shifting the by moment the patient yeah. has gone out of the surgery or the yeah. orthopedic table so i personally don't bother too much about the position of the irm flaps at the end of the surgery right. they somehow seem to finally rest in that area once the patient has gone and yeah. almost in capillary reaction it might be going you do the oct the swept source oct you find the macular hole closed I think uh, I was. Uh, Rajan, any any uh, any comments? Daraz, I would just like to make one comment. Uh, Hi, Rajesh. Well, yeah. so good evening. Hi, Rajesh. Yeah. 
uh, it was really wonderful to see that aditya the way you you know removed the tokar and did that yamani to me i really it was impressive you know something the other you know an iol which has fallen can be you know we can do a bit technique with that i think and there's that, some problem with the connection when well, that was a nice one i mean that was really interesting thank you Thank you. Thank you. Should we move on to the next? Uh... Yeah, I think. So. Hello, sir. I'm asking. I would not request after the rash rock to. I think, uh, sir, we have to pay. Uh, there's a. duty to perform and that is to play the uh, the sponsors video at this point in time i think we can yeah. take the talk after this derives huh? so can yeah. we play the sponsors video please share my screen uh, good evening, good evening everybody so after hearing those two exciting talks i'll be talking a bit about recurrent rectal detachments because this is one beast we really need to tame and uh, good visualization with digital microscopy really helps us do that so i'll just start with some of the merits and demerits i think uh, Dr. Natarajan has really described a lot of these already, and so has Aditya. But just a few points which I thought were important about the digital uh, microscope, and then I'll talk about recurrent RD, which are most challenging cases. Hence, the visualization part is even more critical for the success of these cases. So, like we discussed, Artebo 800 is it a new era or is it a new toy in our armamentarium? and it has definite advantages it has more surgeon comfort as dr natarajan showed higher magnification good depth of focus despite the magnification and excellent resolution with high magnification especially at the posterior pole a, a big advantage of the posh pay for the patients is there's low light exposure so less chance of light toxicity and you can change the color value of the light which you use while operating so for example blue colors for high myopes or albinotic fungus fundus green for the vascular prolifs and yellow which has less reflections under air 
a great advantage of this current system is you can uh, there's a ability to switch from the screen to the microscope view so it, you don't need to really do a lot of maneuvers for that because uh, of the design of this microscope so you can switch and do it as per the surgeon's preference and there's the lag is so it's really earlier always the problem used to be the lag but with this system the lag is almost imperceptible for us uh everything has its disadvantages so of course there are some or logistics for example the cataract surgeons sitting temporarily would need to change the screen position depending on the right or the left eye of the patient being operated for the assistants they need to turn their neck so all this needs more space in the or placement of the vitrectomy machine anesthesia machine etc because you don't want anything coming in the way in the sight of the screen and you need to have that particular distance where you keep the screen some of the other challenges we faced a bit were the reflections or intraocular structures and instruments and sometimes the peripheral working poses a challenge so sometimes we need to vary the illumination quite a bit more and this depends on the intensity used so this is a just a nutshell about the system and let's move on to our topic for today which is recurrent rd which is basically redetachment of the retina after successful primary attachment and although the failure rates have decreased due to advances in surgical techniques and ad advancements in visualization it is a reality which every vr surgeon has to face from time to time this can occur after a pneumatic retinopexy after buckling or after vitrectomy causes would be the ineffective closure of the break at the time of the surgery miss breaks new breaks occurring intra or post operatively development of a macular hole or because of pvr how do we manage this you can either inject a gas and do a pneumoretinopexy you can revise or add a scleral buckle you can do a vitrectomy or you can do membrane peeling under oil i'll be showing surgical videos of all these steps so recurrent rd after buckle additional of a buckle element i think aditya said buckle has become very rare but i think we are still little old fashion we still do it quite often and this is a fake patient uh, 47 year old we didn't this patient after buckling you can see the buckle effect but still had some nasal fluid so we didn't want to really go a vitrectomy or touch the lens so you can see we did something which we which is very rarely done now we did a revision buckle where a new buckle element has been added and this is the nasal quadrant so this is just about and the medial rectus and this is where the buccal element was missed and there was a miss break which was located superior nasally so this could be covered and you can see the post op optos picture with the well attached retina below and patient had a restoration of vision if we talk about vitrectomy being done again let's it must be done in a step wise manner so if the, for the anterior segment if there's a cataract please do a phaco or a lensectomy if the iol is unstable remove the lens at the start you decide the gauge and putting a buckling element is quite important in most of these cases why because buckling relieves the circumferential and ap traction it isolates the peripheral retina from posterior forming a new ora serrata and we normally use 240 buckle or 276 uh, tire if there are large inferior breaks spend time on membrane dissection because anterior pvr is more common in these vitrectomized eyes because there's a large skirt of uncut vitreous in the periphery go back tackle the posterior pvr tackle the membranes and subretinal oils then do the ilm peeling if required and the role of retinectomy and tamponade is also going to be discussed so if we can see my first video this was a case where we did bimanual surgery for posterior pvr this was a case first we removed the oil and you can see there was some anterior capsular phimosis which was preventing view of the retina so as we always said visualization is the key is very important in these cases so we did that we opened the thing and now the chandelier is put the chandelier really helps with which you can just see how much better the view is now and how we can proceed with bimanual surgery with the placement of the chandelier and if we look carefully if we find the cause of of this traction is this napkin ring like membrane which is subretinal so by manually we pull and although there is a retinotomy this membrane is quite adherent and with both hands we pull it out and this is a hand upon hand maneuver which i'll show you later again and this is how we can remove the membrane in toto 
and this is the only way we could re release our the entire traction which was causing this kind of a stiff retina and the retina is uh, opposed and we do laser to this so a few tips and tricks so for tackling subretinal bands this is the hand upon hand we derive inspiration for vitro retinal surgery from the hand upon hand manner in which a bucket of water is pulled out of a well we depict a bimanual technique for tackling subretinal bands in recurrent rd based on the same principle in this 24 year old boy with recurrent rd we carefully choose the point of the retinotomy at the site of confluence of the subretinal bands and marked it with endodiathermy we then entered the subretinal space with n gripping forceps and bimanually removed the bands atraumatically using hand upon hand technique we did so this is another case which was like a courts case we talked about they had also shown but uh, this was a patient who earlier had a treated retinal detachment in the periphery but came with a acute on chronic rd and this is you can just see so there's a lot of subretinal exuration cholesterol crystals etc and first so we find that this is why the retina is not going back so so we realize that we may need to remove this so first we try to remove the epiretinal traction with the bimanual technique and now you can see how the subretinal membranes along with the cholesterol crystals are coming out bimanually and this i think was important because some of this was gravitating posteriorly and would have had a outcome uh, on the visual outcome also so you can see how extensive it is it's we didn't even realize it's this would be so extensive initially when we started the surgery and you can see how nicely it is visualized with the system and this is what allowed us to kind of do it and even at the time of now you can see the fluid air exchange taking place break is settled but now you, you have a look at the posterior pole we are there with the flute needle and you can see these crystals migrating and going in so this also helped remove all this material from the posterior pole in fero tempor in fero nasally also there was a separate area which had been earlier treated and this just did not attach initially so we made a separate small retinotomy and this is what this was settled and laser was done sometimes finding a break is also quite tough in these uh, in certain cases of redetachment so this was a little uh, interesting video we made for that on how to locate an occult break Had a recurrence two years post silicon oil removal. There was an inferior shallow RD along with previous laser marks, but no obvious break was seen. We tried to locate the break with the help of Schlereen with a brush medium, but we were unsuccessful. We thought out of the box and made a 38 gauge retinotomy and slowly injected subretinal brilliant blue dye. As the dye filled the subretinal space, we had a eureka moment. We saw the blue dye emerge from a very tiny temporal break near a laser mark. Once the break was found, we removed the dye with a brush needle, then performed the fluid air exchange and settled the retina. So that was something which was just gave us a clue as to where these small occult breaks can be. uh what are other thing which i would like to talk about is circumferential anterior traction and this is something which is a real bug bear in recurrent rd and we had we have described a maneuver called tug of war which was really useful for this so i would like to just show a small animation and a video on that in these cases i like to perform a maneuver called tug of war based on the shearing force a rope undergoes during the game We use opposing forceps to tug and shear the membranes gently and relieve the traction without resorting to a retinotomy. See this young, highly myopic girl with circumferential traction bands predisposing to anterior PBR. This maneuver allowed us to bimanually release anterior circumferential traction. We took two forceps at 180 degrees to each other. 
then pulled and shredded the bands holding up the retina. Once the bands were separated from the underlying retina, they could be safely trimmed by the vitrectomy cutter. As the traction was released, the retina fell back and settled without requiring any retinotomies. With a sigh of relief, we performed laser to the attached retina. So in fact, this maneuver gives good results in even severe cases where you can have a closed funnel kind of detachment. And this was a post buckle also, very often we get such cases. So you can again see the two forceps performing the tug of war. So basically it prevents us from having to do large retinectomies or relaxing retinotomies in the periphery by doing this maneuver. This was another young girl who we operated and retina attached quite well. This is the post-op photograph. This is briefly how it is. You take the two forceps to break the bands. And I'm happy to share this is published in one of the recent issues of uh, Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, uh, tug of war bimanual technique for anterior circumferential PVR in recurrent RD. So now uh, the PVR can be located anywhere. So this is a patient who I wanted to show who had posterior and anterior PVR. So like we described in the slides in the beginning, first we would like to tackle the posterior PVR. And now we are fortunate because we have a lot of instruments in our armamentarium. We use the forceps initially to kind of grasp it and make a plane and then the cutter can be used gently. And because we're using 25 gauge cutters, we can really go close to retina safely and trim these membranes using those. So here we can see it was a fake patient, so we don't even use a microscope. We, the anterior PVR we are tackling directly with direct visualization. And in a bimanual way with the right hand scissor, left hand forceps, we are kind of removing the anterior PVR. And now with the cutter, we can separate it and it goes back and gets attached. Uh, this is another case I'd like to talk to you about. I said a, a retina detachment was there in a, a high myop. So this was a patient you can it was, it was a very high myop. Axial length was 33 mm. And there was a failed macule hole. So although he was operated and ILM was peeled, still the macule hole did not close. And then he came to us with a retina detachment and a total vitreous hemorrhage. So that time we could not image the patient. So we were wondering how to close the hole because closing the hole was essential for settling the detachment also. So you just like to have a look at the surgery. So we, in fact, we put us encircling 240 belt buckle and we removed all the heme and we saw there's a bulbous RD and you can still see some of the heme is there in the periphery and there was a large macular hole. So here again, we used amniotic membrane. I think a beautiful video Aditi also showed for this. And we decided that we would plug the hole using the amniotic membrane. This has been described by Professor Rizzo first from Italy and we have not done too many cases, but we have found it useful in uh, cases which are really, really recalcitrant or situations like that, macular holes and very high myopes with a retina detachment. And here you can see bimanually we're settling the amniotic membrane over the macular hole. And uh, PFCL is there in place. Now we do the fluid air exchange and laser all around. And you can see the buckle effect also. So this patient, you can see, this was a failed hole and you can see the nicely amniotic membrane plugging the hole and you can make out what a high myope it is. You can see the contour of the sclera in this. And these are the post-op pictures. You can see a nicely attached retina. In the center picture, you can see the membrane and in the lower one, you can see it plugging the hole beautifully. This is another pre-op versus post-op picture. Membrane peeling under oil. So this is another small thing, a tip we'd like to say that if you have a recurrent detachment with a focal area of uh, traction, you don't really need to remove all the oil. You can just do a localized membrane peeling under oil and then you, you uh, can settle the retina quite well with this maneuver. 
tamponade, I think everyone knows about it, but just a little thing about heavy silicon oil. This has been designed to overcome the disadvantages of silicon oil and gas. They are heavier than water. And because of the high increased density, they go good endotamponade effect to the inferior and posterior pole without having to do the prone positioning. In the normal uh, position also, or sitting up or lying down supine, they give a good tamponade. And the problems with the inferior RD is normally the oil has lower density than water. It floats up and the surface of the lower retina periphery is not tamponaded well, which allows a, miquous, a mixture of aqueous and growth factors, which we call PVR soup, to kind of accumulate. And this always uh, promotes the development of inferior PVR and a recurrent inferior RD. So that's why the RDs with PVR and open inferior breaks or membranes or patients who are elderly or children with positioning issues, this is a good option. But the problem is, it's, of course, it's not a substitute for an incomplete surgery and uh, the issue of cost and availability is there with this. So I'd like to just conclude with this uh, slide, which I just explained to you. If you have a recurrent RD post vitrectomy and the oil has been removed, so see the slide on the right, then you, need, of course, have to do a re vitrectomy and all these maneuvers, which I just spoke to you about. If the recurrence is in an oil-filled eye, then look, if there's just inferior uh, break and no PVR, maybe you can just add a laser or a buckle at inferiorly. If they are focal membranes, you may just get away with a relaxing retinotomy in that area or membrane peeling. However, if there's extensive PVR, subretinal gliosis or subretinal oil, you need to do all the, go all the way with the oil removal, peeling of the membrane, managing the lens with retinotomies, bell buckle, and refilling the silicon oil. These are my acknowledgements. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daraes. Uh, some very nice videos and very informative talk of the principles of tackling this difficult situation of recurrent retinal detachment and all the manifestations of anterior PVR, posterior PVR uh, under oil and uh, this failed macular hole as well. So I think we really had a very nice session. And uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers for their excellent talks. And uh, thank AIUS for giving us the opportunity to have this symposium. Thank Namrata, Rajesh, Dr. Natrajan, of course. And uh, Thanks, Zais, for posting this uh, webinar. Rajesh, would you like to? Yeah, I would just like to thank you for uh, you know chairing the session and uh, you know um, sharing your experience with everyone. Some of uh, the wonderful presentations we had of all the three presenters. So thanks to all the presenters. Thanks to you, sir, and of course uh, thanks to Zais for. Uh, sponsoring the session and um, we would really love to have such uh, nice sessions in future as well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.